Well, welcome, 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 everybody. Hey, I'm just curious. Do you have a box or a crate or maybe a drawer like this that's just filled with all kinds of, you know, random gizmos and gadgets and plugs and adapters and cords that you've been collecting over the years? Yeah, go ahead and nod your head right now. That means you're normal. That means you're a human being. My guess is we all have one of these things, and we, we pick these things up occasionally, and we lift them up, and we say, hmm, well, I wonder what this is for, and I wonder what in the world that's for. And, and the reason why we have this in the first place is because we think that maybe, just maybe, someday down the road, we're going to need that cord or that adapter or this gizmo or this gadget, whatever it might be be that the fate of the modern world will be dependent upon whether or not we kept this or we kept one of those. I mean, really, this is why we do this. Now, the question I asked earlier, i.e., what is this for, over here is actually a purpose statement. And this is where we're going for the next four weeks as we launch into a brand new series called Life on Purpose. We're going to talk about purpose. And if you ever feel like this represents your life right here, like you're existing, you know, you're taking up space, but you just can't quite figure out what it's all about, what on earth you're here for, then I want to promise you that this series is going to be so helpful for you. And as we begin this four-week journey together, I have a, a word for the day. And the word for the day is this word right here. It's context. Context. And the, the point I want to make about context is simply this, that there is no purpose outside of context. There is no purpose outside of context. And if that sounds a little bit confusing to you, let me go back to all of this. There's no purpose outside of context. In other words, there needs to be someone to step up and to take each one of these things and say, oh, that? Oh, oh yeah, that is for this. And, and this right here, that's for that. This cord goes to this and that. That adapter goes here. Oh, that's for your cordless drill. Oh, that cord right there, that connects your old VCR, some of you still have them, your old VCR to your old TV. And on and on and on and on it goes. That's what I mean by context. There is no purpose without context. You see, I only know, I only know what something is for, what its purpose is, when I know what it's connected to, which is its context. Let me read it again. I know it's early for some of you. I know you've only had one cup of coffee. I only know what something is for, its purpose, when I know what it's connected to, its context. Any questions? Yeah, I see that hand. Uh, Pastor Phil, I've got a question. What? What are you talking about? How does, how does any of, of this, how does any of this relate to my life? How, how, does, how does this help me find my purpose or find meaning? What does this have to do with God? What does this all have to do with the Bible? All this talk about context. And, and, and what is it all about? And, and I, I promise to get there. I, I'm going to get to the Bible. I promise you. But first of all, I want to I wanna quote an atheist. And then I want to quote an agnostic before I quote out of the New Testament. Let's start with the atheist. Bertrand Russell, very famous atheist, said, unless you assume a God, the question of life's purpose is meaningless. Now, I just want to go on record to say I fully, 100% agree with Bert here. Unless there is a God, unless there's a creator, a maker, a designer, someone, someone who can step up and say, oh yeah, that goes with that, and this goes with that over there. Unless someone can do that for us, for my life and for your life, unless there's a creator that can do that, then talking about purpose is meaningless. And, and if there's not a creator, a grand designer, an architect of our lives, then what agnostic Clarence Darrow said is right on too. The purpose of man is like the purpose of a polywog, and I defined it for you, a tadpole. To wiggle along as far as he can without dying or, or to hang to life until death takes him. Thank you, Clarence, for the encouraging words, right? Yeah, and, and whether you're an agnostic or an atheist or you're a theist, and a theist is someone who believes in a God, 
regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, first of all, I'm glad you're with us. But secondly, I just want to say, I think we all want a different perspective. On top of what these two men said, I think we want another perspective. And that's what I want to give you as we grab our Bibles and turn to a New Testament book, which is called Colossians. We're going to go to chapter 1 of the book of Colossians. A little bit of background. Paul, uh, the apostle, the great evangelist and church planter in the first century world. Paul wrote a letter to a church that he started in the ancient city of Colossae. It's now known as Turkey, in the region of Turkey. But he writes a letter to this church that he started because a bunch of false teachers have infiltrated the church and what they're saying, what they're teaching is that Jesus was not God, that Jesus was not fully God. And so Paul writes them a letter around 60 A.D. And what we read right now out of Colossians chapter 1 is the letter that he wrote them. And as we look at chapter 1, go down to verse 15, what we see here is, is the beginning, the starting point for you, for me, for us to find our purpose in life. Let's see what Paul writes. Paul writes these words, Christ. Talking about Jesus here. Christ is the visible image. And I put the Greek word down here for you. Icon, because some of you are familiar with that word. Icon. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. In other words, Paul starts off by saying to these false teachers and these, these people who are being duped into believing that Jesus is not God. He says, hey, wait a minute. First of all, you have to understand that Jesus came to this planet to give us a visible snapshot. Think camera here, icon, a visible picture of what the invisible God is like. Jesus came and Jesus said, hey, you want to know what God the Father is like? Look at me. Look at me. Because I and the Father are one. And then he goes on in verse 15 and he writes these words. He, Jesus, existed, I want you to hear this. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, talking about Jesus, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. All right, we got to call another quick time out here. Okay, who was in existence before anything else? Answer, Jesus. Yeah, and oftentimes we think about Jesus had his start in Bethlehem 2020 or so years ago. And that's just not true. Jesus was in existence for all eternity. He came to earth at Bethlehem. But the, the other question is, okay, and who, who created everything? And the answer again is, is Jesus. Yeah, not only was he in existence for all eternity, he was also the one who was behind creating every single thing that we see and even the things that we can't see. And again, for some of you, that's kind of like, whoa, I didn't know that. I think of Jesus dying for my sins on the cross, being raised from the grave, conquering sin and death. But also on Jesus' resume, you need to hear this, you need to understand this. On Jesus' resume, is not just that he's the savior of the world, he's also the, the creator of the world. And then we get down to verse 16. And this is where things get interesting, where Paul writes, everything, everything was created through him and for him. Speaking about Jesus again, everything was created through him or by him and everything was created for him. Through him and for him. This is the starting point to us understanding our purpose purpose will just be out of our grasp. It's going to be like, you know, the roadrunner trying to catch Wiley Coyote. Purpose is just going to be outside of our grasp. It's going to be, meaning is going to be a little bit like murky until we understand what, what Paul is saying here. That everything, everything was created by Jesus and everything was created for Jesus. Flowers, flowers, flowers were made by Jesus. And now they bloom. And isn't it beautiful right now? They bloom for Jesus. Fish were created by Jesus. By the way, this is my favorite fish right here, largemouth bass. Fish were created by Jesus. And they now jump out of the water for Jesus. And once in a while for me. Eagles were made by Jesus. And now they soar in the sky for Jesus. Bluebirds 
were created by Jesus. And now they sing so beautifully for Jesus. The sun. The sun was created by Jesus. And now it rises. And now it sets for Jesus. Stars. Stars were created by Jesus. And now they shine so brilliantly at night for Jesus. Cheetahs. Cheetahs were made by Jesus. And now they run up to 80 miles per hour for Jesus. Cats were made by, all right, I can't go there. Because actually we're pretty sure that cats were made by the devil. All right, uh, but don't miss the point. Don't miss the point. The point is that Jesus, Jesus is the, is the creator. Jesus is the designer. Jesus is the one who is behind all the things that we see and all the things that we don't see. You see, and when we talk about purpose, okay, what is my purpose? We don't start by asking this question, what am I here for? No, we start by asking this question, who am I here for? It's not about starting with, hey, what am I here for? No, the question is, who am I here for? And it makes sense, doesn't it? I, it, it makes sense. It, it, just like if, if I didn't know what something was for, I, here, here's something over here. I would go to the inventor of whatever that is that I don't understand what it's for. I would go to the inventor and say, hey, wh- why did you make that? I would go to the designer. I would go to the creator for that. And that's why we go to Jesus. Because he is our maker. He, he is the one who designed us, who made us As Genesis chapter 1, first book in the Bible, says, made us in his image. And David, the the guy who wrote the Psalms in the Old Testament, the, the great king, giant killer David. In Psalm 139, this is one of my favorite Psalms. He writes these words, you, you, talking about God, talking about Jesus. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together, listen to these next words, in my mother's womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Did did you hear that, friends? Did you hear that? Jesus, Jesus, God is the one who was intricately, and I might add intimately involved in our formation. It's God who is at work, even in our mother's womb knitting us together this is why this is why this is why life is sacred from the womb to the tomb because god is at work does that does that verse make it sound like you're an accident does that verse make it sound like you're a mistake do do, do those verses make it sound like we are the product of some random pond scum coming together no 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 god is the one who made us. God is the one before we were ever born, before we ever took a breath. God was the one intimately involved, knitting us together. Now, I'm not a knitter. I've tried. I'm not a knitter. But my wife is a knitter, and she's really good at knitting. And I love just like watching her knit, whether it's a sweater or a a pair of slippers or something for the kids or grandkids. I just love watching her do it. But after watching my wife knit, here's what I can tell you about knitting. You don't knit anything haphazardly. You don't knit anything accidentally. You don't just start and all of a sudden something is beautiful and something is meaningful and something is worthwhile. No, you knit something very, very carefully, very, very meticulously, very, very purposefully. And the Bible says, David says, the Psalms tell us that that's how God made you. And that's how God made me, very carefully, deliberately, with great intentionality. And that's why we turn to Jesus to to find our life purpose. I I don't turn to biology and Darwin. I I don't turn to uh, physics and Hawking. I don't don't turn to economics and Marx. I don't turn to psychology and Freud. I, I don't turn to technology and Musk. I don't turn to sex in Dr. Ruth. No, I turn to Jesus to find out what on earth I'm here for. Why? Because Jesus is the grand designer who steps up, 
who takes the box full of disconnected things and answers the question, what's that for? He answers the what's that for question. And as Jesus looks over this globe of ours, as he looks over our planet, 7.9 billion people, you know what he does? You know what Jesus does to every single human being, all 7.9 billion of us? He looks at us and he says, I made that one. And I made that one. And I made that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. And I made that one. That one's mine. And that one's mine. And that one's mine. He, he belongs to me. And she belongs to me. And the problem, of course, comes when we say, well, you know what? I don't want to belong to you. I, I, I want to... I, I don't want to go your way. I want to go my own way, which, by the way, friends, is the essence or the nature of sin. What sin is simply is simply this. It's simply me saying, I don't want to go God's way. I want to go my way. It's me living out the great theologian Miley Cyrus' song when she sung, this is our house, this is our rules, it's our party, we can do what we want. And you know what? She's right. We can do what we want, and we oftentimes do what we want. But as soon as we turn away from our maker, as soon as we turn away from our designer, our creator, what we do is we sever our relationship with him. That's what sin does. It severs our relationship with God. It disconnects us from our purpose, and all we end up being is this right here. This is our lives disconnected and severed from Jesus. This is what happens. And it's only a matter of time, it's only a matter of time before we feel that lostness, that lack of meaning, and that lack of purpose. Back to what Paul said. Paul said everything was created through him and for him. This is the starting point for you and me finding our purpose. And we're okay with the first part of that, everything was created through him. But you know what we like to do as human beings? We like to tweak the last part of that verse and make it this right here. Everything was created through him and for me, for me. That, that's, that, that's what we do as human beings. And that's why there's so many people of the 7.9 billion people in the world, that's why so many of them are walking around saying, I don't know what I'm here for. I don't know what my life is all about. I don't, I don't have any meaning. I don't have any significance. I don't have any purpose in my life. And the reason why is because you and me, we're not made. We're not made to, to live for ourselves. We're not made to, to walk away from God and the purpose that he has for us. And the minute we do that, the minute we start living just for ourselves, is the minute that we lose any kind of significance or purpose or meaning in our lives. Now, I don't want to sound rude here, but here's the truth. You are not enough for you to give your life for. And I'll put myself in that. I am not enough for me to give my life to. I, I, we're, we're made for more. We're made for living for, for more than just ourselves. You see, this is God's house. This is God's world. This is God's dance floor. This is God's party. God's name is on the marquee. And as soon as I put my name on the marquee, as soon as I start living as if the, the, the whole point of life is me, is the moment that I'm going to be disappointed and lost and lacking purpose. One of the saddest parts of my job, one of the saddest parts of my job, I hate, I hate even bringing this up, but I have to. One of the hardest parts and saddest parts of my job is doing a funeral for a person who lived for themselves, a, a person who, who was all about just themselves. Uh, they, they, they were self-absorbed. They were self-centered. Their, their focus in life was just on them. Because what happens is when we come to that point in the memorial service for that deceased person, when it comes to that point where we ask people, hey, would you stand up and pay tribute to the deceased? It's so sad because all you hear are either crickets or what you hear are a bunch of trivial, mundane things from people who finally stand up and say, oh, you know what, yeah, yeah, you know. Hey, she could, she could down more mojitos than anybody else at the bar. 
Or you hear someone say, oh, he, oh yeah, he, he showed up earlier than anybody else at work and he stayed later than anybody else. And I sit there and I say, really? Really? Th- that's, that's your legacy? That you were a workaholic? Or that you could outdrink anybody else at the bar? That's, that's your legacy? But friends, that is our legacy. If we make life all about ourselves. You see, here's the truth right here. Whoever devotes themselves to nothing but themselves will have nothing but themselves to show for themselves. That's a mouthful, but that's profound. I want to read it one more time. Whoever devotes themselves to nothing but themselves will have nothing but themselves to show for themselves. And can we all agree together, every single one of us, could we agree that that is not going to be our story? That we're going to live for something bigger than that, than ourselves. Let's all commit that we are going to live a life on purpose. On purpose. Now, speaking of that, um, one of my favorite pastors, and I've got several favorite pastors, like probably like you do, but one of my favorite pastors is a guy by the name of Rick Warren. And Rick wrote a book, and here it is right here. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. It's 360 some pages, and it's absolutely profound. It it, it did pretty well, I might add. It it actually sold about 50 million copies. That's right, 50 million copies. But the thing about the book that I absolutely admire more than anything else is the very, very first line of the book. Think about this. The very first line, page one of 368 pages, it's the very first line that is absolutely brilliant. Rick Warren nailed it. You say, well, what was the very first line of the book that's all about purpose? Here it is right here. It's not about you. It's not about you. You say, well, what's not about me? Life is not about you. What, What you're here on earth for. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about God. And that's why Paul wants us to know, if you want to, you want the starting point for finding purpose and meaning and significance in life, you don't start with yourself. No, 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 no. It's not about you. No. It's all about God. It's all about God. It's through Him. We were made through Him and we were made for Him. We were made by God And we were made for God and for His purposes. Now, if you ask me, Pastor Phil, would you write a book on purpose? I would say absolutely. But my book would be a lot shorter than Rick Warren's book. In fact, my book would only contain two sentences. Pastor Phil's book on purpose, two sentences, and here they are. Sentence number one, start with Jesus. Why? Because He made you. Because He is your Creator. Because he knit you together in your mother's womb. And because he loves you. In fact, he loves you so much, he died on a cross for you. And if you want to find purpose, start with Jesus. That's my first sentence. My last sentence of my book would be right here. Strive to get to know Jesus better every day. Why? Why Why strive to get to know Jesus better every day? And the reason is very simply this. Because the better you get to know Jesus the better you will understand your life purpose. So are you? Have you started your life with Jesus? Have you? And are you striving to get to know Jesus better every day? Someone has once said that the three most important days of our lives, the three most important days of our lives are, number one, the day that you were born, and you can all just go check on that one, right? Been there, done that, right? Number two, the day you were born again. In other words, the day you opened your life up to Jesus. The day you said to Jesus, Jesus, come into my life. Because from this day forward, I'm going to follow you. That is your spiritual birthday. And when you invite Jesus to come into your life, you are born all over again. You experience a spiritual rebirth. And the third most important day of our lives is this right here. The day we figured out why we were born, and why we were born again. 
And that's what this four-part series is all about. So I want to ask you, I want to ask you, come back. Come back for each of the four installments of this series. Whether you come back online or in one of our buildings, that's up to you. I want you to commit to coming back because what we're talking about is too important not to be part of. And the second thing I want you to do is right here. I want you this week, this week, I want you to read this booklet. It's about 60 pages, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's called, What on Earth Am I Here For? And Rick Warren wrote it. In fact, it, it's, it's his purpose-driven life book condensed down to about 60 pages. I want you this week to take a little bit of time to read this as we begin this journey together. Now, here's the good news. We are giving these away this weekend for free. At each one of our campuses, these will be available. And if you're watching this somewhere online, we're so glad you're with us. You can follow the, 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 the directions below um, and you can find how you can pick up your copy of this little book at absolutely free of charge this coming week. So we're in for quite a journey, my friends. And I want to pray for us. I want to pray for us um, before we do anything else. So let's bow together. Uh, God, we want to thank you today. We've learned a lot. But we, we've learned and we've been reminded that you, that you are our maker. That you are the designer of our lives. That you are the creator. That you were even at work before a single moment had passed. Before a single day had transpired. You, God, you, God, you have been involved. Knitting us together in our mother's womb. And so, God, I want to pray right now. I want to pray right now for that person who maybe has never started with Jesus. They've, they've never taken that step to spiritually be reborn. God, that this would be the day that they said yes to you. And if you're one of those persons, if you want to take that step, I want you to say these words right now, wherever you're at. Just say, Jesus, come into my life. Just say those words. Jesus, come into my life. Thank you for making me. And thank you for dying on a cross for me and my sins. And today, just say these words, today I say yes to you. I say yes to your forgiveness. And I say yes to following you for the rest of my life. So come into my life. Come into my life. And give my life purpose. And give my life meaning. And God, I want to just say thank you. Thank you. For those who just said yes to you. And God, we today, whether we've said yes to you just right now or many, many years ago, we say yes to you again. Yes to following you. Yes to living life on purpose. And so God, we look forward to what you're going to do in these weeks to come as we gather together in your name. And we pray this in the name of Jesus.